Hello and welcome to another Ukraine war update. In this update, we will discuss several videos that have emerged online over the past week. We will also witness a few situations that may be considered first-time occurrences, at least in terms of being captured on camera for the general public. Every like and comment is greatly appreciated as it significantly aids the YouTube algorithm. Let's begin immediately. Here, you can witness one of these unprecedented events. This video footage was captured by a Ukrainian drone and depicts a Russian Mi-28 Havoc helicopter attempting to shoot down the unmanned aerial vehicle from close range using its 30mm cannon. In the second unprecedented event, the Ukrainians turned the tide and embarked on an alligator hunt using an FPV drone. The events from both clips are exceptionally rare, at least when captured on camera, and are also very difficult to execute successfully. Here, we witness a Ukrainian soldier attempting to shoot down an approaching Russian FPV drone inside a forest. The attempt fails, and the soldier has to seek cover from the attack, which, fortunately, also misses. While all attempts in the previous three clips may be considered unsuccessful, they still raise awareness of the issues drones can pose, as well as the new possibilities they offer. What you see here is one of the many raids conducted by units affiliated with the Ukrainian military inside Russian territory. For clarification, I am not referring to Russian-held territory here, but rather to Russia itself. This raid was conducted by the Russian Volunteer Corps, a paramilitary unit of Russian citizens based in Ukraine. According to Ukrainian military officials, the group is not a part of the Ukrainian armed forces, but I believe it still can be safely assumed that there is at least a slight affiliation with the Ukrainian military here. We can see the combatants engaging what has been reported as Russian FSB members, two of whom were reportedly KIA. However, I cannot confirm this from the footage alone. The raid was conducted by what appears to be a small squad-sized element using small arms fire and shoulder-fired rocket launchers in the Russian town of Podvitoy in the Bryansk region. The town is only about three kilometers away from the Ukrainian border and therefore a suitable target for cross-border raids. The men seem to be well equipped and even had an N-Law at their disposal, which they also made use of. Such raids have become more and more frequent occurrences and aim to slowly undermine Russia's stability through their consistency. They are generally conducted by small squad to platoon-sized elements of Russian citizens who oppose the course of the current Russian government. This comes in pretty handy for the Ukrainians, who can deny any direct responsibility and involvement in these kinds of actions, but Russia also instrumentalizes these attacks to fuel their own narrative. In another Ukraine war update, Demonstrating a similar operation conducted by Chechen fighters, I have already mentioned that such operations make sense from a military point of view. On many occasions, it is better to take the fight to your enemy, but I believe the tactical results of these operations are limited. I also do not know to what extent the Russian narrative, fueled by these attacks, nullifies the psychological effects on the Russian population regarding their acceptance of Russia's war effort and the current government. However, in the end, these operations are just one of the many tools in a giant toolbox and have to be seen as part of a grander scheme. What you just witnessed was the moment the Ukrainian M113 variant drove over what I believe was an anti-tank mine. The event was filmed from inside the vehicle by a soldier of the 3rd Separate Assault Brigade wearing a helmet camera. The mine disabled the vehicle, but it appears that all of the soldiers in the back were okay, even though I'm sure they felt far from okay in this situation. I'm sure their heads were ringing after the blast, and there could have been at least some minor concussions and bruises. However, the men remained as calm as they could be in this situation, especially when taking taking into account the fact that hitting a mine is not always the end of the story. In general, Russian mines disable the vehicles first, making them easier targets for FPV drones, drone drop grenades or anti-tank guided missiles. Recently, I made contact with members of the 3rd Separate Assault Brigade and the possibility of an interview with one of their fighters has arisen. The plan is still in the works, but they have agreed to not only answer some of my questions but also yours. So, if there's anything you'd like to ask, please feel free to leave your questions in the comments and I will select as many of them as possible to ask during the interview. I think that this is a truly interesting opportunity since the 3rd Separate Assault Brigade is essentially one of Ukraine's spearhead brigades that has undoubtedly experienced a lot of unprecedented action. So, feel free to leave or upload the questions you want to see in this interview in the comments. Also, do not forget to subscribe, ring the bell and enable all notifications for this channel if you have not already. This way you won't miss it when it's released. If you've watched this video up to this point, I wanted to express my gratitude. I feel truly honored by it. I never imagined that so many people would watch and like what I have to say. Thank you very much. Here, we can see a Russian soldier being saved by his quick reaction time. The soldier throws a grenade that hits a tree and bounces back towards him, to which he quickly reacts by pushing it away midair by using his hand before jumping for cover. 
The short clip appeared on Telegram, but was also shown in Russian state television as part of a larger video giving more insight into the assault that led to this event. It also gives us insight into how Russia handles the footage produced by their troops in combat in Ukraine and who these videos are aimed at. While in the first few days of the war, especially the footage from helmet cameras and amassed troop concentrations was largely aimed not only at their own people but also at Ukraine and the world in general, it has strongly shifted to being almost entirely produced for their own population mainly. When it comes to FPV and Lancet drone strike videos, I still would consider them being aimed at the West, Ukraine and countries sympathetic to Russia but any extensive depiction of combat operations rarely makes it to us. Most of the videos, aside from the numerous Lancet and FPV drone strikes, only depict small snippets of specific situations. Especially, their helmet cam videos are not always as informative as this clip here, for example. There are several reasons for this. The first one is that the reality of ground combat in Ukraine contradicts their narrative of a special military operation. This war is not a special military operation. I agree that it perhaps might could have been one of the success achieved in 2014 in Crimea had been replicated by the Russian military on a larger scale during the first days of the 2022 war, which was exactly what the Russians had planned. However, it has not worked out that way. This war has become a protracted war of attrition with the potential to continue for at least a decade. The second reason is that all of Russian state TV was banned in the West, and these mediums are traditionally the major channels for such videos. The mill blogging scene in Russia has become quite substantial on Telegram, but the release of footage is still largely centralized through official channels, which, as I mentioned, are blocked in the West. The third reason is that Russia has to be quite careful about what they share, perhaps even more careful than the Ukrainians. Ukraine actually has thousands of pro-Ukrainian individuals scattered all over the world dissecting and geolocating every piece of information obtainable from those videos. And I haven't even started discussing Western intelligence services doing the same. All this information is then passed on to Ukraine and used against Russia in every way possible. Here we see a large number of Ukrainian Leopard 2 tanks that are at least slightly surpassing two companies when it comes to numbers. Some of them got upgraded with explosive reactive armor. There is also footage of a destroyed Leopard 2A4 with this ERA. This is quite an interesting video depicting a Russian unmanned ground vehicle towing a Russian soldier away. I assume they are testing this for its potential use during casualty evacuations, and I believe the Ukrainians also already successfully used this method in combat. Due to the nature of the conflict, evacuating wounded individuals is extremely challenging on the front lines of the war in Ukraine. Firstly, quick air medevac simply isn't and evacuating with vehicles is also often not possible, leaving only the option of carrying the wounded away, which comes with its own set of problems. In general, this results in long evacuation times. It can take several hours to get a wounded individual off the front line, and sometimes evacuations can even be delayed up to 12 hours and more before an evacuation even can begin in the first place. Both sides face that problems and so it totally makes sense to consider the use of unmanned ground vehicles for this task since it can save time and manpower. However, using unmanned ground vehicles comes with its very own sets of problems and current limitations as this video demonstrates. I honestly do not know from when this was, but I just found it recently. This time, the Russians released a larger amount of footage, and after I pointed out the lack of helmet camera videos in my last update, it seems that a lot more of exactly this was released. They even released a 20-minute body cam video from the front, but I left it out since it didn't really show much. However, they also released this grainy video here, but it essentially displays all the issues I mentioned previously when discussing Russian footage in general. The video reportedly shows a small-scale Russian mechanized assault, but overall doesn't provide much information. We can see the soldiers dismounting and firing at alleged Ukrainian positions in the distance using small arms fire and RPGs. What makes this video special is that it's notably longer than what we're accustomed to seeing in Russian helmet camera videos, even though it doesn't show much. What's interesting is the angle at which he holds his RPG, indicating that the target he's aiming for is actually fixed and quite far away, suggesting that this is more of a harassment attack than an actual assault. Why bad is that they were targeting Ukrainian trenches in the distance, and we're actually not in the range of Ukrainian small arms fire. Also, it pretty much shows the contrast between footage produced for Russian state media and mill bloggers on Telegram. This is what I actually consider footage aimed at news medias from countries with a population that is at least partial sympathetic to Russia. Especially India and Indonesia come into my mind here since it are both countries with large populations in which many have sympathy for Russia not because they have something against Ukraine, 
but because they do not like the West in particular. Also, there are a few Indian and Indonesian channels with large subscriber numbers who have already become a daily hub for this footage and almost exclusively only post Russian videos. Like Western media channels massively re-upload Ukrainian videos without even watching the videos, they do the same thing only with Russian videos giving the whole thing Cold War 2.0 vibes. I think that this is a fact that often gets neglected in the West, and we always think that these videos are mainly aimed at us what is not the case. Russia wants to draw a picture of them resisting the whole economical and military might of the West that dominated the world for centuries and wants to send this message especially to countries that are either BRICS members like India, or have at least the potential to become one like Indonesia. Not to speak of all the African countries who want to see Russia in exactly this role it shows itself in for historical reasons. I could be wrong here, but given the fact that Russia's operations in the informational domain against the West and also Ukraine were not as successful as they used to be in the past before the war started in 2022, I think they started to additionally shift their focus more to the regions I mentioned before. This however does not mean that the West and Ukraine are not targeted anymore. They are, I just think that they realize that there are also other fruitful grounds for informational operations aimed against the West and other regions. In the end people will believe what they want to believe and I know this pill is hard to swallow but there are actually quite a lot of people outside the West who want to see someone taking on all that economic, cultural and military dominance the West had for centuries. In this Ukrainian trench assault training video we can get a glimpse of what trench warfare can be like in a few months when the weather changes and it starts to get more rainy and muddy. It also indicates that Ukraine plans to continue their offensive operations under these conditions and is actually already training for it. I think that they will continue with their small unit bite and hold tactics especially since the weather conditions alone will most likely deny them much other options if they do not want the Russians to freeze the conflict. Trench warfare is already hard enough but in muddy terrain and tree lines without any foliage for concealment it will get significantly harder. Ukraine is still pushing hard in the south and made progress in the last week. The main fighting even reached Russia's first main line of defense as footage and reports suggest but this conflict will definitely still take a while until it is finally decided who the winner is. Another Ukraine war update, another helmet cam video from the 3rd Separate Assault Brigade. This brigade is one of the most active Ukrainian brigades when it comes to footage, especially helmet cam footage. Here, once again, we can witness one of the many battles that frequently take place in the area south of Bakhmut. We see a small unit attacking Russian dugouts and what remains of a tree line visibly scarred by heavy shelling. The shelling was so intense that not a single leaf was left on the trees, depriving the assaulting soldiers of any foliage that could have concealed their advance. They captured a Russian soldier who surrendered in this fight, but you already know my stance on showing such things, so I've cut this part out and only mention it verbally here. As said, if you have any questions you would like to ask a fighter of this brigade, feel free to leave it in the comments. I will pick as many as I can. Please keep in mind that there might be questions that cannot be answered due to operational and or personal security reasons, but given the fact that this brigade is quite transparent when it comes to showing them operate, I think there still will be a lot of interesting stuff we can ask and discuss. Simply leave a comment with your question and upload other questions you like to see. The overall terrain in which these guys operate illustrates why Ukraine currently primarily employs small squad and platoon-sized infantry assault tactics. While the terrain is well suited for armored vehicles and large formations to advance under the current circumstances, this is hardly possible due to Russia's defense in depth strategy, the concentration of Lancet and FPV drone attacks, and consolidated Russian artillery barrages directed by drones. Such large pushes and amassing of forces would most likely result in significant casualties and are basically everything Russia prepared for. Also, I find it interesting that no expert ever mentioned that Ukraine currently fights the way like NATO supplied them. Step by step, piece by piece, one step at a time. The Western aid has been steadily and slowly but consistently flowing into the country and Ukrainian troops are also slowly seeping into the Russian-occupied territory. In the end of the day, constant dripping also wears away the stone. If this tactic will work out in the long term is a different story, but right now it grants slow but constant progress. I am certain that no one wants to see a well-coordinated and consolidated massive assault pushing to the Sea of Azov in a few weeks or even days more than the Ukrainians themselves. However, this was simply not possible to begin with. The large minefields alone are a huge obstacle on their own and Russia simply had too much time to prepare. This has been said many times before, but people still overlook this fact, so it always has to be repeated.
That's it for this Ukraine war update. I hope you found the information I shared valuable and gained insights from this video. I am very thankful for every viewer who stuck with me throughout this video as there was a lot I really wanted to convey. I hope everything made sense to you. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know with a thumbs up. Also, feel free to discuss what I've said in the comments. I'm always eager to hear your perspective. I know many viewers are silent observers and that's perfectly fine. However, there are times when you should not stay silent, not only here but also in real life. Always remember that, make sure to subscribe, hit the bell, and enable all notifications for this channel so you won't miss any new Ukraine war updates. I'll link another interesting Ukraine war update here for you in case you missed it. If you appreciate my work and want to support me financially to become more independent from YouTube, you can do so by buying me a coffee. This really helps and motivates me, but it's not mandatory, of course. I am grateful for every form of support, no matter how small. Thank you very much, and until next time.